right now. Okay. So General Electric, you know, as I mentioned, had the best and the brightest minds at the time. And they expanded this concept further. And what they came up with after reviewing all of the technology that was available was a semi-positive displacement progressive cavity grinder pump in a basin. They felt so strongly about this that they split off and invented their own company, which is still in business today over in Albany, Niskayuna area. And that was the birth of pressure sewer. Poll question number one, right out of the gate. Okay, Sherry, you want to launch that? There we go. What type of sewer collection system has minimal environmental disruption, solves difficult application issues, is reliable, and saves money? A, pressure sewer systems. B, septic tanks. C, a fast-moving creek. D, none of the above. We'll wait for just a few more seconds for everyone to answer. If you're having problems answering, if it's not doing it, minimize your screen a little bit, then you should be able to answer it. Okay, I'm closing out now. And the answer is A, pressure sewer systems, and we hope everybody got that right. Did good. I think that was a softball, but that's good. <laughs> All right, so we're good to go forward? Yes. Pressure sewer system uh, is a collection system. It's a wastewater collection system that uses individual grinder pumps to macerate the waste, turn it into a fine slurry, and then pump it through a small diameter pipe, collecting one or many other homes on the way. So if you look at this graphic, um, that pretty home on the right, say, let's say that's down by the lake, um, gravity's not going to work, clearly, right? Gravity doesn't go uphill. So we don't want the wastewater getting into the beautiful lake, river, or groundwater, whatever the case may be. So we can employ a pressure sewer system where the waste is macerated, pumped under pressure through small diameter pipe, following the contour of the land in picking up other homes on its way to uh, efficient and effective uh, wastewater treatment. And that's, that's the heart of a pressure sewer system. Let's look at it a little more in depth and why you may use it. Um, over the years, it has gained uh, a lot of popularity. We like to say flat, wet, rocky, hilly, uh, meaning that pressure sewer is capable of going anywhere. It's all terrains. You can go flatland, wetland, rocky, or hilly. And big, expensive gravity systems are somewhat prohibitive, prohibited in these uh, environments, not only because of cost, but just logistically. Um, if you think about various rocky environments, mountains, mountains of Pennsylvania, even in New York, um, hilly areas, flat, you know, there's many, many applications where if there was an alternative, you could collect the waste. And we have that alternative and it's pressure sewer. Since it was employed in, in uh, the 1960s, it's gained wide acceptance. There's over uh, a million easy uh, installations throughout the globe, Australia, Europe, North America, South America. Um, pressure sewer is a go-to uh, method of collecting wastewater. It has lower environmental impact, Okay, we like to say it has a light touch on the land. As far as construction, the contractors love it because you're dealing with smaller pipe, smaller crews. You can build as you go, and you can really have a uh, button-down schedule for putting in uh, large amounts of pressure sewer. It has a lower capital cost, which we will discuss in detail, as well as operation maintenance, and it just gives you a lot of flexibility. So in this picture, you can see, uh, you know, there's different methods of doing it, but basically there's a station with a pump in it outside the home. Wastewater flows into it and gets pumped away. 
simple, simple. Um, just like the heart of your body is a pump, you know, the heart of the pressure sewer system is also a pump. Uh, so you're going to have the, the basin, which collects the wastewater, and then you're going to have a pump to move it away. There's a couple different technologies out there uh, that are most common. One is a progressive cavity pump, which I've already talked about, or, or semi-positive displacement. And the other is centrifugal, which many of you uh, may be aware of. In either case, you're going to have some sort of uh, level sensor. So when the waste goes into the basin, it'll turn the pump on at a predetermined level. You're going to have a device that, that macerates that waste and turns it into a fine slurry. Okay, and you're going to have a control system that turns the pump on and off, as well as a way to get the pump out of the basin. This is, these are the components of a pressure sewer system. If we look at a cutaway, uh, on the right, you've got a home uh, with an alarm panel. And coming out of that home is going to be a gravity feed into the station. Uh, it's going to get macerated and pumped out to the left. So let's look at it a little bit more. As the waste flows from the home into the station, the level will rise. The pump will turn on at a predetermined level, macerate the waste into a fine slurry, and pump it out the discharge into a small diameter pipe heading towards the force main, out, usually out by the road. Uh, and before you get there, you most likely will come across lateral assemblies, which include check valves, fall valves, and clean outs in some cases, usually acceptable, accessible via a uh, curb box. So these are the general components that you will see, uh, mostly underground. All you're gonna get to see is the alarm panel and the top of the tank. All right, you can see here, I just described it, the, the wastewater flows in, turns on. And the thing about the uh, pressure sewer systems, you know, you might be thinking you're used to pumps that run at a, at a duty point and they turn on and they never turn off. With a pressure sewer system, the philosophy is to get the waste in and out of the basin as quick as possible. So we use a lot of uh, small durations, okay? That pump's gonna run for about 30 seconds to 45 seconds, uh, it's gonna do its job and get that wastewater out of there. So we don't want the waste to sit in there over time and get corrosive and stinky and all that. So it's gonna run multiple times during the day in quick, short sessions. So again, shown on the left is the uh, cutter wheel. In this case, that's a big cutter wheel to efficiently uh, macerate the waste and then it's going to pump through the uh, discharge pipe out to the force main. Poll question number two. Kevin. Yes, sir. There we go. Okay, question number two. The fluent pumps, grinder pumps, and vacuum systems are example of these. A, stinky systems. B, pumps. C, sewer collection systems, and D, leachate designs. We'll stay on for about 10 more seconds. People still voting, going up. Three, two. Okay, and the answer is C, sewer collection systems, and congratulations to everybody that got that right. Back to you, Greg. I think the questions are getting harder. Okay, so let's look at um, the two different types of uh, pumps used. Uh, for grinder pumps and pressure sewer systems. 
you have the centrifugal on the left and the progressive cavity on the right. With the centrifugal pump, you're going to have an impeller that rotates at a fast speed. And what that does, it imparts a velocity to the liquid, which is then squeezed through a balloon to create pressure. And that's how the centrifugal pump develops its head or pressure. With the progressive cavity pump, the semi-positive displacement, we call it semi because there is a little slip here, which I will explain. You have a stainless steel rotor with lobes on it that turns at a slower speed inside elastomeric stator that has chambers. And as it rotates, it pushes the liquid from one chamber to the next, increasing the pressure as it goes. It is referred to, that concept is referred to as the Moino principle. It's the rotation of the rotor inside the elastomeric stator. Now, if that stator was rigid, uh, you would have a positive displacement pump, but it's semi-positive displacement. There's a little bit of slip and give in the elastomeric stator, which provides a long, long life uh, for that piece of equipment. So again, it's going to get macerated, moved up into the stator assembly, pushed through by the lobes, and out to the discharge. Poll question number three. Okay, the blank principle is when a rotor turns within a stator, creating a sequence of sealed chambers that pushes the sewage through. Answers are A, prevailing, B, Moino, C, high school, or D, centrifugal. Uh, 10 more seconds. Okay. And the answer is B, the Moino principle. Back to you, Greg. Excellent. So a semi-positive displacement pump characteristics, the way as I described it, results in what we call a nearly vertical curve. So if you look on the right to this, uh, this chart, what you have on the x-axis or the bottom is gallons per minute. And then going up the y-axis is uh, total dynamic head and feet. Um, and then there's also pressure on one side. But just looking at the curve, you can see that there's very low variation in flow as the pressure changes. So even as that curve uh, starts out at 14 gallons per minute and moves up to the left, it only goes to about eight. So it was a very predictable output. And that is important. A predictable output allows you to size the piping downstream of the pump just the way it needs to be sized. So if you think back to our glass half full, it's not going to be an oversized glass, okay? It's not going to be an oversized um, pipe because you know exactly how much that pump is going to put out and when you add them all together you can really dial in the size of that piping so it's a very efficient system so there's very low variation in flow as compared to a change in pressure conversely when you take that same vertical curve and overlay it with a centrifugal pump curve, which you might notice here on the, on the right side, um, the centrifugal pump curve starts at zero gallons per minute and goes out towards uh, 42 or so, and has a sloping. That's a large variation in flow as the pressure changes. So how does the pressure change? Well, the pressure is gonna change when everybody's showering or doing their business at 6.30 in the morning, as they get ready to go about their day as compared to 10 30 in the morning okay so as pumps turn on and off you're going to have a variation in that system with the centrifugal pump it is going to hunt back and forth all day long when it runs and it will affect the life of that uh, piece of equipment in comparison to a progressive cavity pump 
which has the low variation in flow, you're going to get the consistent output regardless of how many uh, pumps are on in any given time. Poll question number four. Okay, centrifugal pumps pumping at low flows are prone to what condition? A, high voltage, B, plugging, C, motor overload, D, cavitation. About 10 more seconds will do it. Got votes still coming in. <clears throat> okay, I'm closing it. Okay, and the answer is D, cavitation. All right, so that, you know, that's a little bit of a harder question. Uh, on either end of a centrifugal pump curve, you're gonna have cavitation, whether it's recirculation cavitation or flow cavitation. So let's talk about a real example. You know, what if there was this large city in the Midwest uh, that needed to replace not one or two, but 20,000 septic tanks, which they have determined are completely polluting their environment and having a great impact not only on the environment, but also financially in that city. Now, this city has challenges. Not only is it densely populated, but there's also a beautiful river that runs through the city, uh, through major neighborhoods and developments. And what if you were sitting there and somebody dropped that project onto your desk? Said, look, we need to clean up this city. You've got to get rid of these septic tanks. You're going to reach into your your cabinet, if you will, and probably pull out the last gravity job that you heard about uh, if you have to design it. But with this winding river and dense population, gravity is not going to be the solution. So in this case, the city of Indianapolis, Indiana, um, Citizens Energy Group, which oversees all the energy in the city, was tasked with that very problem. And today they are well on their way to replacing over 20,000 septic systems with the combination of pressure sewer and gravity where it makes sense. And we are partnering with them to make this, uh, you know, make this a reality. With the river that runs through the city, I mean, what would you do? You can't, it's, it's almost impossible to put gravity underneath that river. It cuts, and then you'd be cutting up roads and neighborhoods and you'd have equipment in there for years on end. Uh, but with pressure sewer, as I outlined earlier, flat, wet, rocky, hilly, they can use the flexibility of that collection system to replace and abandon 20,000 septic systems. So the city of Indianapolis is undertaking a project to remove all their septic systems, and it's very successful. They're able, with the use of pressure sewer, to designate neighborhoods, fix one neighborhood, move on to the next, fix that, move on to the next. It's a very efficient project. And that's a real world example. Some of the advantages, uh, as I mentioned, that we would cover, <clears throat> small diameter pipes, they allow for a shallow installation. So you're not getting deep, deep gravity, 15, 20 feet. Okay, you're getting smaller, shallow installations. You can use trenchless methods. You can follow the contour of the ground. Uh, again, so you don't have to dig up Mrs. Jones's garden or Mr. Jones's garden. Um, you can go around it or under it. Okay, these monuments that I call them, you know, 100-year-old trees. With pressure sewer, you have a light touch on the environment, and it's a lower social cost. So pictures are worth a thousand words. There's a unit being installed so you get an idea of what it looks like on the right. And after everything is said and done, uh, you can see the restoration on the left with that landscaping outside the home. You can barely see the station behind those uh, cute little gnomes there, um, the tank sticking up. So it's flexibility, light touch on the land. 
Unlike other um, pressure uh, wastewater collection systems, like uh, vacuum comes to mind, there's no centralized structure, okay? The pump at the home is capable of macerating that liquid and pumping it uh, miles in many cases. So often you can pick up other homes on the way and get it right into the uh, wastewater treatment plant. Or it has flexibility. You can get it to maybe there's an existing lift station uh, for a gravity system. You can get it to a force main. There's a lot you can do with it. There's no central uh, infrastructure that, that is required. And when it comes to inflow and infiltration, because they're, uh, you know, it's basically a sealed system under pressure, you're not going to get the inflow and infiltration. You're not going to be treating rainwater. All right? Pressure sewer system is a great way to eliminate uh, or to, to rectify the problem of large inflow and infiltration systems. As far as system sizing go, you can connect one home or you can connect hundreds, thousands in many cases. Um, it's just a matter of uh, letting your representative help you with the design uh, to make sure that the piping and is sized correctly. Again, we pressure sewer is capable of picking up very difficult to sewer areas and it can be used with existing systems as well. And we talked about replacing failed septic tanks. You know, most of those tanks were put in in the 50s. 80% of them are failing and polluting the environment. I think we've come a long way where we can do something better. And in relation to that, uh, based on uh, outside data, not mine, 20% of the homes in the United States are connected to septic tanks. And each year, 10 to 20% of those septic tanks malfunction. And it's due to improper design, maintenance, or location uh, of the wells. The septic systems continued the majority, over 67% of reported outbreaks of contamination from 1971 to 2008. So we have a problem on our hands, but we also have the solution. So when talking about sustainability for pressure sewer, there's three driving factors, the economic, social, and environmental. Economic costs include things like capital, operation and maintenance, all right? Social, when I talk about social costs, it's uh, community disruption. It's, it's a closing of roads. It's having big equipment on the vacant lot in your, in your neighborhood for months on end. Um, it's traffic impacts and it's just a lower quality of life. And that big equipment has carbon footprint associated with it as well as noise. So when we talk about environmental costs, when you're putting in big projects or even little projects, there is something to consider, um, especially with the flexibility of pressure sewer, not having to dig up beautiful trees and landscaping. Those are environmental costs. There was a study done to compare um, open cut versus trenchless emissions. And you can see the CO2 levels and the greenhouse gases you know, there's really no comparison there. In talking about social costs, you know, here are some pictures. Big equipment, putting in big gravity, um, road disruptions. There's worker safety. It looks like the guy on the right was, was working in the hole and the, the walls collapsed on him. They're trying to get him out of there. Um, the social costs with big gravity projects is a diminished quality of life. Pressure sewer systems can be installed, again, with directional drilling, trenchless technician technologies, or even just low impact cut and cover, which is probably most common. Um, you can plan it in phases, you can get in and out quickly, and you can have a lower social cost to the environment. And here are some pictures of a gravity system. You've probably all seen these. Uh, big infrastructure going in the ground. Okay, these are big gravity systems, big disruption. In comparison to pressure sewer, where you have the directional drilling, the low, low impact cut and cover, uh, it's a much cleaner, much lighter touch on the land. 
all of that translate into economic costs, okay? So on the right is what uh, we call a life cycle cost analysis, which your representative can get you for free. Um, it'll show you the uh, cost components of a pressure sewer system versus a gravity system. And gravity is not free. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. There are capital costs, construction costs, project costs. Uh, there's O&M related to big gravity systems. And, you know, when you start to take those into account and put them out over time, you can have a real analysis that will give you directional uh, information on how to proceed. It has been proven that construction costs for low pressure, low pressure sewer systems or pressure sewer systems is typically 20 to 60 percent less than conventional gravity systems. So if you're in a rural, rural community, money's a little tight, pressure sewer can help bridge the gap and get you a collection system that's uh, gonna protect the environment. So here's a, another case study. Um, what if there was a sprawling countryside surrounded by two beautiful lakes, but nobody could swim in the lakes because they were polluted. Property values were plummeting, so you had this beautiful home, and now with the lakes being polluted, you can't sell your property, you can't renovate, you can't do anything. And then what if the EPA came in and said, you need to clean this up, and you were the person that had to do it? Well, that happened in Twin Lakes, Indiana, which was once considered uh, a playground for Hollywood way back when. And Lakes Freeman and Lake Schaefer make up the Twin Lakes. And the Twin Lakes got so polluted that it was obviously killing the economy. People didn't want to be there. You couldn't eat the fish. Uh, you couldn't swim in the lakes. It was a major problem. And it was the major driver was failing septic systems. So using pressure sewer, they were able to get rid of the septic systems and sewer the entire lake. And today, after about 5,000 hookups, you know, I'm proud to say that the lake is a sportsman's paradise. You can swim in it, you can eat the fish, uh, you can have a grand old time in Twin Lakes, Indiana. And that's because of the flexibility of pressure sewer systems. Looks like we have another poll question, Kevin. Yep. Question number five, the last question, folks, a semi-positive displacement pump is preferable to a centrifugal pump in a pressure sewer system because A, it is highly unpredictable, B, being semi-positive displacement means it's half the price, C, low variation in flow relative to change in pressure, D, the rotor design is very easy to replace. Got about 75% people have answered, so we'll wait just a little bit longer. People are still answering. Okay, I'm gonna close it now. Okay, the answer is C, low variation in flow relative to change in pressure. Excellent. So in looking at our construction, so Sherry, you got the screen? <laughs> okay. Looking at the uh, construction cost drivers, gravity sewer, you're gonna have large pipes and deep trenches. Pressure sewer, smaller diameter pipe, shallow bury, easier construction. Gravity sewer, uh, multiple lift stations. You know, if you've been involved in gravity sewer, it has to obviously gravity down to a low point. From that low point, there is usually a lift station or a big pump to move all that waste back up to uh, a, a wastewater treatment plant. And sometimes there are multiple lift stations at a large price, anywhere from 100,000 and on up, I would suspect. So you're gonna have multiple of those. That'll drive the cost. You're gonna have expensive 
dewatering, and, and a lot of environmental disturbance, as I mentioned. With pressure sewer, because it is under pressure, you are likely not going to have any lift station, depending on your system. It's smaller equipment, smaller crews, faster production. And you're not tearing up yards, roads, and things like that. So this is a construction cost comparison. These are actual data points from actual jobs throughout 50 years. And you can say just directionally, the brown globes are uh, the cost of gravity per connection. And the blue ones are pressure sewer. And it represents about a 35% um, lower cost for pressure sewer in comparison. So if we look at the cost drivers, uh, you've got your main line, you've got the things associated with the main line, on-property restoration um, or on-property work, restoration of the on-property, and then lift stations. And these are the major components that drive the cost. And it has a much higher cost impact on the gravity than it does for the pressure sewer. And you can see the numbers there. So it's just a graphical representation of a lower cost for pressure sewer. The Water Environment Research Federation evaluation, an independent organization, showed conventional gravity sewer systems to be 80% more expensive than pressure sewer systems. And these are just some numbers, give you some directionality. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit different, but they're, they're pretty uh, down close to what we experience. So when we talk about reoccurring economic costs, you know, when I talk about gravity, if you've ever been to a trade show and seen those big trucks, uh, those are not free. Um, they believe it or not, you, you can't get them for free. It does cost money. Uh, so there's a lot of money associated with gravity uh, that people forget about. And there's a lot of maintenance and cleaning and things like that. Um, if you start to get inflow and infiltration, you're going to have to rehab that system. And that can get expensive. Uh, and it goes on and on. So if you thought gravity was free, think about it a little bit more. Think about all that equipment. Think about all those crews. It's not free. And part of that uh, is the reason why companies like mine develop a life cycle cost calculator to show you the operation and maintenance and the construction costs so that people can make an informed decision about which way uh, to go when considering a collection, wastewater collection system. Oftentimes you can compare not only pressure sewer to gravity, but also other technologies like step or vacuum. And you can get real directional numbers, real time over the life of the project. And you can make informed decisions about the best way to go. Reach out to your representative. You can get this life cycle cost analysis for free. Happy to help you out. So there are myths and misconceptions as we get towards the end. Uh, gravity sewer. Hey, once that's installed, it's free, right? No regular maintenance? False. As mentioned, lift stations require daily or weekly visits. Often um, a lot of preventive maintenance to keep them running. Electricity, uh, cleaning of the wet wells, odor control, landscaping. All of these things, these are not free. Mainline sewer systems, there's some of that equipment that I mentioned. That's not a free truck right there. Uh, you're going to pay for that. Regular inspection, et cetera, et cetera. So what about pressure sewer? Grinder pumps are a constant source of maintenance. They're expensive to repair. You know, who in the world authorized 200 grinder pumps in my town? What, are you kidding me? Look, grinder pumps do not require extensive preventive maintenance, and they are not a constant source of maintenance. That Twin Lakes, Indiana case study I showed you is run by a crew of four technicians, and two of them are senior. Um, so there's not a lot of day-to-day -day maintenance required. Well-designed pressure sewer systems uh, are easy to maintain, and they're very well accepted throughout, throughout the globe. 
They require no preventive maintenance. The life expectancy of the pump is 15 to 20 years. Not to say that it doesn't require uh, some service, okay? When we say MTBSC, that's mean time between service calls or red lights, if you will. And on average, the pumps run 10 years between service calls and that's supported by data. So 10 years between uh, a red light going on where you may have to replace a stator or something like that. As far as electrical operation, because it runs infrequently for a short amount of time, it's really less than $25 per year. And the annual pump maintenance, we advise municipalities if they own the pumps to budget between $30 and $50 per year per installed pump. And then on average, you know, you'll catch up and that'll be enough to have in the uh, bank, if you will, to handle routine maintenance. So what do you see now? You still see, you know, a glass half full, half empty, or you see a precisely designed and optimized pressure sewer system fully capable of handling all of the requirements that you have and precisely sized. That's what I see. I'd like to thank you very much for listening today. If you have any questions, um, we can take them now, or you can feel free to reach out to your local representative. Hey, Greg, I did answer a couple of questions along the way, but there was one that brought up um, wipes today, which is a big issue. Would you just touch base on that just a little bit? Did you say rights? Wipes, the, the wipes. Wipes, w oh, wipes? Yes. They so wipes they, are like the, go ahead. No, they, they asked how E1 handles the wipes. Yeah. The wipes are like the scourge of the wastewater collection industry. Um, our pumps can handle a, a normal amount of wipes flushed down the toilet. And what happens is it gets in the basin. And because we turn at a slower speed, we'll take bites out of the wipes, uh, you know, a little bit at a time. So it's not sucking it in and getting uh, clogged. And some of the other manufacturers have high speed pumps that will suck that wipe right in and those wipes are unforgiving if you get it in the impeller um, but with our system it takes small bites out of it and will evacuate it over time if you dump the whole packet down there or an excessive amount no pump is going to be able to handle it and you will uh, if your municipality owns it you'll get a, a terse letter explaining not to do that again so Although they're flushable, we don't love them. Kevin, do you Was see any other questions? Else? Okay, one just came up. Can you make a non-grinder semi-progressive with a vertical curve? I do not like to specify yeah. grinders with septic systems. Uh, not sure I fully understand the question, but I can say the nature of the curve is the semi-positive displacement technology. Um, you can have it without a grinder pump. You can have it without a grinder. Uh, my company does not make those. Uh, you could have a semi-positive displacement pump, sure. Um, in order to work on the pump, can you valve off the pressure side inside? Oh, sorry, things are moving. Um, inside the pump chamber? Yes, inside the pump chamber is a um, shutoff valve that is easily accessible. You can turn that by reaching into the tank with the wrench. Uh, it's, a, it's an up and down, it's called a flag valve. Um, you just throw the flag and that will close out um the mainline pressure from coming back into the pump at you and from there you can follow appropriate procedures to pull the pump out or do whatever okay um here's one is how do you deal with the odor and noise that being that close to the house right so because our philosophy is to get the waste in and out as quickly as possible um where it's been proven that there is no odor and because it's a one horsepower pump that runs intermittently 
There's no noise. Uh, you can stand next to it and barely, barely hear it. Um, yeah, we have, you know, like I said, hundreds of thousands of these and it's not an issue. Um, odor can creep in uh, to be a problem on seasonality, uh, cottages and things like that. And what we simply do is advise the homeowners to try to run, you know, like a bathtub of clean water uh, before they leave so that waste isn't sitting in there while they're, you know, down in a warmer climate somewhere. Um, but odor uh, in most cases is not a problem, nor is the noise. Okay. Um, can you discuss the limits of property owner ownership and responsibility? Yeah, so there's different ownership models and they vary throughout the country and even throughout the state. Sometimes the homeowner is responsible for the unit, the pump. Uh, sometimes the municipality is. Sometimes the homeowner owns it, but the municipality does the service or, and, and it goes on and on. Um, but generally, if the homeowner is responsible uh, for maintenance 100%, you know, that's their business. They contract with, you know, good people that are on the phone here today, like Seward Equipment and RF Mahoney, and they'll, they'll set you up and take care of you. If the municipality is responsible for the service, there's usually a temporary easement where they're allowed to come in and maintain the uh, equipment. Okay. Um the gentleman who asked about the, can you make a non-grinder semi-progressive with a vertical curve? He said the concern is maceration ahead of a septic tank. Right, so with pressure sewer, we don't pump into a septic tank. We abandon the septic tank and pump it out uh, to a force main on its way to be treated. And we would not recommend, it just doesn't make sense uh, cost-wise or efficiency-wise to um, just pump it into a septic tank. You'd skip the pump altogether. Okay, um, most often installations homeowners own and municipalities maintain or, do, or no homeowners does both? I, I cover, you know, from Florida out through the Midwest, I would probably say a, oh, the majority is municipality owned and maintained. There's a lot of good reasons for that. Um, they get, they have control of the equipment. They can control the reliability and predictability. They can control what's going into the treatment facility, which they operate. Whereas if you allow homeowners to go out and choose, they go to a Home Depot and they pick up the least expensive piece of equipment they can and put it in there and it fails. And you end up having a system that doesn't work, which will, you know, create havoc for the municipality. So I see a lot of different ownership models. I do, um, the bigger systems are usually municipality owned and maintained. Okay. Um, do you have a way to meter flow by the way of an hour clock or other method um, in case you want to bill appropriately and the municipality doesn't have public water? Um, we have a large installation in the Midwest that uses our system for billing. And what they have is an option that we offer um, that's called a protect bus with a sentry advisor, where that information is sent up to the cloud, if you will. And you can download it and see how often the pump runs. And by because the semi-positive displacement pump has a very predictable output, as I mentioned, you can multiply the output times how often it runs and come up with the gallons per minute or a total gallons. Uh, and they use that to bill homeowners individually um, because they have to pay to get the uh, sewage treated. It's a homeowner association. So it can be done. There is uh, There are options available to help you do that. I'd say reach out to your local representative uh, and they can you know, help you out. Okay, there's a few more questions, but I just wanted to say um, people are starting to sign off and we forgot to mention that an evaluation has to be completed. So when we're done with this, it'll close down, the evaluation will be pulled up for you to answer. Um, that is for the PDH credits. So just, sorry, we forgot to mention that. Just want you to be aware. Um, the next question. 
Um, do all the connections going to a universal mean? If so, what's the size of the mean and does pressure build up? So when we look at a pressure sewer system, we design it so that there's multiple zones. So a manageable amount of homes in a particular zone, say five. And then that, that zone is sized for that appropriate amount of homes. And then it pumps into the next zone, which is also appropriate sized, and it goes onward and onward and onward for however many zones you want. So therefore, we are able to size appropriately as we go along. And in some cases, you know, on, on a typical installation, you may have a two inch uh, force main, if you will. You, you know, as you connect more homes, you might go up to a four inch. Six inch would be unusual, be thousands of homes. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, what is the volume of a wet well? We have different options available. Typically, our, our uh, single unit has 70 gallons of capacity, storage capacity, and is designed to uh, evacuate all about 700 gallons per day. Okay, and um, let me see, when you were talking about the meter flow and stuff, it says, so zones are isolated by check valves? Typically by code, there'll be a check valve at the end of every, what's called a lateral. That's the line running from the home to the main line. Um, so yeah, you're gonna have check valves throughout the system so that you can't pump into, the, into your neighbor. Okay, um, there's another gentleman, Van Gelder, sorry if I did not say that right. He um, has a lot of different ones. So I'm thinking maybe we, you and Kevin can uh, do that one offline. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, because it's it's repeated for the same question. So yeah, I would have Kevin re Kevin reach out to him, and you know Kevin's the best. <laughs> and I'm trying to think is that. I think that's it. Let's do a double check, make sure we got them all. Yes. Outstanding. That was a great question. So we're all set. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close it down. Stay on if you need your PE credits to do the evaluation. Um, and if you have any questions, just email me and I will take care of you later. Thank you. Thank you, Chef. Thank you, everyone.